Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Brianne Roth. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Nantucket Historical Association, and we're thrilled to have you here today for another installment of our Spring Food for Thought Lecture Series. Um, before we get things started, I'd like everyone to please check your cell phones to ensure they're on silent so we do not disrupt today's screening and following um, talk. I would like to take a moment um, to say that all of our programs here at the NHA are made possible with support from our members. Your NHA membership helps us accomplish everything that we do every single day. So if you're one of our members, we thank you. And if you have not joined yet, um, please do um, visit our friendly folks at the front desk or check online at NHA.org. The Food for Thought lecture series um, is um, made possible by the MS Worthington Foundation and media sponsorship is generously provided by Novation Media. The Food for Thought um, lecture series is um, dedicated to the late David Worth Sr. Huh? No, no, I'll go. Um, today's program actually features two <coughs> speakers today. Um, the first is John Copenhaver, um, who has been coming to Nantucket for over 20 years. He has lived on both coasts of the United States as well as Central Asia and Russia. He spent many years working in finance before serving in the Peace Corps and teaching at the college level. Copenhaver was inspired to try his hand at filmmaking um, by his eclectic group of friends and acquaintances here on Nantucket. Um, many folks here may have seen him in performances, and he's also um, a board member of the Theater Workshop of Nantucket. Um, joining John today is filmmaker um, and TV production um, uh, Larry Lacain. Um, Lacain has had a lifelong fascination with television and learned TV production at w WGBH in Boston, where he worked with people like Julia Child, Mike Wallace, and Dave Garraway. Lacane pioneered film production when minicams came along, working on productions such as This Old House, Nova, and Frontline. Um, companies such as ABC and NBC came to rely on him for shows like 2020. Um, David McCullough requested for Lacane to direct the introductions for the program, The American Experience, and he worked on Bob Villa's syndicated show for 18 years. Lacane has been recognized by the National Academy three times for his efforts in his field. Um, please join me in giving a warm round of applause um, for John Copenhaver and Larry Lacane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was a little surprised at the turnout. I figured a beautiful day on, on Nantucket in March, I'd have my wife in the cleaning clue, and that would, that would be about it. But, uh, and I wasn't even sure my wife would show. <laughs> in fact, I thought I saw her. Oh, yeah, she is. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all of us have had uh, experiences where we tried something new. And for me, the genesis for this project started in the fall of 2015 when I went to the Nantucket Short Film Festival. And there were seven or eight short films done by locals in the, in, from the island. And they, I looked up and I said, hey, I can do that. The, the uh, announcement at the end of the show was that the Channel 18 W, I mean, uh, NC... Uh, TV had equipment, and they would provide training, and, and you too could make a film. So on the spectrum of knowing nothing and being a professional uh, filmmaker, I was on the know-nothing end, and uh, I got inspired and went, uh, went to, to uh, the, the station and, and took a short course in... Uh, you know, which, which end of the lens do you look through uh, a bit on editing and uh, got inspired to uh, do a film. Now, then the question becomes, well, what kind of film do you do? Well, on Wednesdays, mostly during the winter, but year-round, there's a group called the Romeos, which is a retired old man eating out, which is a bunch of characters. And I, I decided to do a film about the Romeos. And uh, I went and talked to uh, uh, the guys, and they said, yeah, sure. And we brought Larry Cam, and we did a couple of sessions of the Romeos. But it turned out that there was really more to it than just the Romeos. And I have a very, uh, as the introduction said, I have a very sort of eclectic group of friends. I have the uh, the... Salt Marsh Bridge set, which is their own group of older people. I have the guys I play poker with on, 
Monday night, which are the electricians, the plumbers, the firemen, kind of a different group. I play golf at Maya Comet. Uh, I uh, involved with the theater. Uh, so I have a pretty eclectic group of friends. And as I was talking to friends, the theme came up that, that everyone has a story. How did you end up in Nantucket? Well, you know, I, I was following a girl, or I had a job, or I took the wrong boat, uh, which is a true story, actually. Uh, uh, or I didn't know that it was an island. I thought it was someplace else when I took a job there. So there are lots of stories about how people came to Nantucket. And unless you're actually born on... Is anybody here born in the Cottage Hospital? Ah, okay, we've got one, a Nantucketer. All right. If you're born on the ferry, it doesn't count. You've got to be born on Nantucket. So there are... You'll see this in the film. There are, there are basically three kinds of people on Nantucket. There are the natives, those born in the cottage hospital or at home. The summer folk, and that ain't any of you because this isn't summer. Or the rest of us, the wash ashores. And we, each one of us has a story. Um, so in the process of kind of the evolution of the film, uh, I said, well, see, I really need someone who knows what they're doing. Larry, uh, <laughs> Larry uh, and I have known each other for a few years, and I went to Larry and said, hey, can you, I'm thinking about doing this. Can you give me a hand? He said, sure. And Larry has a tremendous amount of experience uh, in uh, filmmaking and television, and uh, so I, I uh, seduced Larry into joining me in this, this little venture of ours. Um, the process of the, of the filmmaking is, is, is somewhat, some of it is mechanical. You go, or not mechanical, but uh, pretty straightforward. You shoot the film, like Andrew is doing right now, and then you uh, have to decide what kind of film you're going to make from the material you have in a... Uh, in a Feature-length Spielberg movie, you'll have a, a two-hour movie, and they'll have 200 hours of film that they have to edit, cut down, and pair. Uh, the editing process is the, is the most difficult part of filmmaking. It's, 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 first of all, it's pretty tedious. And second of all, it's, uh, there's a lot of technology involved, and uh, it's, really, it's, it's not that hard to take a 20-minute film and get it down to five minutes. But getting a 20-minute film down to one minute is really tough and have it still make sense. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, we'll see that when we actually show the film today. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we'll have some... Uh, revelations from people in the audience after the film about how, they, how you all came to Nantucket. But uh, let me introduce uh, Larry, uh, my good friend Larry, who's going to... Yeah, everything you said is true. <laughs> um, so I wrote some things down. Uh, let, me, let me read through this and then see if we have questions. And we have a film to watch, too. It was the best part of school. Uh, adults, grown-ups, ask kids what they want to be when they grow up. It's because the adults are looking for ideas. We are looking for ideas, too. So we'd like you to start thinking about what kind of film you might like to make. You're, you're, it's not on the final, so you don't have to worry about that. The hardest part about making the film was the concept. Like, John started out with one idea, and it became another. Your concept does not have to be profound. Shallow is the standard for video. <laughs> I, like, I like shallow. I'm very comfortable in that water. The television target audience IQ is that of a smart 11-year-old. So you don't have to aim too low, but uh, they won't stay interested if it's too simple. On the other hand, if you aim too high, you're going to end up with my dinner with Andre, and no one's going to watch that. <laughs> so most films, you've agreed uh, to the idea that you might make a film, you're going to have to decide what, what kind of film you want to make, like a drama, 
We don't have that kind of money. We're not going to do a drama. You can do a comedy that you can knock off a parody pretty easily. You can do experimental film. I knew I knew work with a guy who said he was an abstract video artist. He didn't make any video. He just thought about it. <laughs> and the last kind to do is documentary, which is what John uh, decided. So you've got, a, you've got an idea, and you know the genre. What, what do you shoot? That's why he wrote me into this. How do you visualize this? There are rules to follow, so it gets a little bit easier. All literature has rules, video included. Uh, to start, you might think of a film that you liked and copy that style. There's no shame in interpretation. We, we all steal from everybody else. That's how we got here. You know, that's how we get art. Uh, for example, in the first century, Vitruvius analyzed Greek sculpture, and he wrote down the ratios. Uh, later, Leonardo, centuries later, Leonardo expressed those ratios, and he gave us the Vitruvian man. You know, that great... Leonardo didn't think that up. He was copying somebody else. So there's no shame in copying. You don't have to be a Leonardo. Just give, it, give the best shot to what you have and work with what you have at hand. All books are composed with the same set of words. Arthur's just changed the sequence. In drama, plot lines are basic, and they change with the times. Boy meets girl becomes boy meets boy, or today, boy becomes girl. The form you choose helps to shape the film you, you make. John chose documentary. Documentaries are based usually around interviews. To keep the audience, uh, keep audience interest high, and to illustrate the narrative, visuals are added. John's film started as one thing and shifted slightly to become another. When he asked people to talk about moving here, they all mentioned the ferry ride. So we were presented with a recurring visual reference, the ferry. We started shooting various ferry boats from the shore, but we couldn't find a vantage point that had enough majesty. What we needed was a dramatic point of view, something close enough to the boat to show its size, yet mobile enough to come around and include Brant Point and later the town of Nantucket. What we needed was a drone camera. Because of budget considerations, we could only ask the drone operator to cover a single arrival. With a little planning, one arrival was enough. The image of a single ferry approaching Brant Point and heading into Nantucket is, strong, is a strong visual representation of moving here. Nathan Palmer, I'm going to give credit where it's due, agreed to use his drone to capture the footage. He listened to a particular piece of music to pace the camera work, and the result was quite satisfying. The sequence became the backbone of the piece, the visual backbone, and it gave us a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the, in that order, too, which is also <laughs> satisfying. All that remained was the hardest part. Condense hours of interview time into minutes of showtime. John did a wonderful job. And he said that was the hardest part. Was, it wasn't hard to get 20 minutes down to five minutes. Trying to get five minutes down to 35 seconds is the hardest part. Um, now he can interview people and listen for sound bites, little bits of conversation that can be strung together to tell a story. Elmore Leonard's advice on how to keep a story interesting was to write everything down that happened, then throw away the boring parts. I could have done it here. If you ask the Han Bushmen <laughs> of Namibia to show you how they make rope from palm fronds, They'll pick the leaves, scrape the chlorophyll away, braid the strands into string, braid the string into rope, tie the rope into a noose, and set a snare trap. Then they show how the snare trap would work to catch a, an antelope. They bring the captive antelope back to the village, and so on. Dramatic. Um, they only see the rope as part of the hunt. There's no separation between the two. There's no boring part to their story. At the other minimalist end of the spectrum, we have Facebook cooking videos, which is a single shot, overhead camera, ingredients added to a bowl, mixed, cooked, and presented. That's informative, 
but not very entertaining. So somewhere between these two extreme examples lies your video. So have you been thinking? Nah, maybe. What would you like your film to be about? I think John's going to come around and ask us that after the film. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, the theme of the ferry coming in, into Nantucket really is the, the backbone of this, of this little short film. Um, I hope you'll enjoy the interviews. There are uh, kind of a variety of people in the in the film. Some of you have seen the film already, but uh, for those of you that haven't, it's a kind of a broad view of different kinds of people from Nantucket. And we'd love to have you sit back and enjoy it. We'll watch the film. So here we have John Copenhaver and Larry LeCan. And can you tell me the name of your short film? No. <laughs> Every, you know, everyone has everyone has a everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. Okay. So can you tell me how you came up with the idea? Well, actually, we, we evolved to that. I started off trying to to do a film about the Romeos, sort of this group of men that meet every Wednesday, and from that it evolved to our first time on Nantucket, then to evolve sort of a love story about Nantucket. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's much better now than what we originally uh, envisioned. What about it? Yeah. So what would you say was the most enjoyable part? Oh, uh, definitely uh, getting comfortable seats on the drone. Was once yeah. once we got that done. Oh yeah, that, after that, it was, uh, it was uh, 200 feet is what I'm allowed to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and what would you say the most challenging part of it was? No question about that. The editing. The editing. Yeah. Editing. People don't realize, do they? Editing is really hard, and it gave me a whole newfound respect for the role of the editor in any kind of film. Right. It's really yeah. difficult. Really difficult. Yeah. And would you? This is going to. This is your first short film. Mm -hmm. And your shirt, first shot film? Yeah. Okay, so do you think that you guys are going to team up and do another one? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What, a follow-up to this or something completely oh, different? Who knows? Whole who knows? Yeah. The John and Larry show. <laughs> that's right. That's what I was saying to you. This could be a show. So I would like to see that. Yeah. Well, good luck, guys. There are three types of people here on our faraway island. Native Nantucketers, summer folk, and the rest of us, the Washashores. What draws us to this island gem? Love, family, work, new beginnings, and what keeps us here? Everyone has a story. Here are a few of them. I grew up in Virginia, a small town where I met Phil, my husband, and we became engaged and were to be married in October of 1945. I'd heard of Martha's Vineyard for some reason, I don't know why, but never heard of Nantucket. <laughs> we both decided that I should come to Nantucket and meet his family, which we came over the 4th of July in uh, 1945. And the Murrays always went on a family picnic to the beach. They made uh, homemade ice cream in the old-fashioned churn freezer. So that was uh, my first experience in Nantucket. So we were married on July 15th. We lived in Richmond five years. So his father wanted him to come back and go into Murray's Tartary, and we moved here in 1951. And I had said, when I'd been all over Nantucket, if I ever did live in Nantucket, I'd like to live in Monomoy. So we bought our, our first lot for $1,000. And my father-in-law said, that sand pit, get your money back. I wanted to marry her. I had rented a limo, and I had I'd taken her back to the house. and. Uh, we, she said, what's this doing here? Um, so I surprised her and said, we're going to Nantucket for a week. So Well, and we should say that my best friend from college was staying in the Somerset Cottages, just up the road, 
and we had planned on right staying with her for a night or two, yeah. but we couldn't get to the island, right? It was like right. sold out flights. So we took the limo and going through Connecticut, I don't know what time it was in the morning, early in the morning. John's trying to fiddle around and he <laughs> gets down on the floor of the limousine and I'm like, what are you doing? The next thing you know, he's proposing. I'm Thank goodness she said yes, because it would have been a very long week and caught the first high line. But as soon as we got up to Brand Point, we just started to shuttle around. And as you're clearing the lighthouse, I saw the skyline of Nantucket and the church steeple. And you can see, you know, the, uh, the slips and docks. And, and I just turned to Susan. I said, one day we have absolutely have to live here. This is, uh, I'm sold. My parents heard about Nantucket. And with another couple, they braved coming out here in 1947. And then the following year, in 1948, I guess, they asked if I would like to come with them. And I had a child at that time. And I said, you want me to bring her? Sure. We'll, we'll rent a room for you and, and Betsy, and we'll all be together. And that was the last time I ever spent any summer, any place except Nantucket. In 1975, going home in the car, then one of us made the comment, we're going home to the real world. And the other one said, which is really the real world? And we decided this was the real world, and we were going to quit our jobs. The kids were all out of school and we were gonna move here, and we did. So I walk down Strait Wharf, and as I'm about to turn into Captain Toby's, I look and I see a sign hanging over the sidewalk, and it says, Strait Wharf Theater. Strait Wharf Theater, and I've just done my first play up at Bates, like two weeks before, I think theater. So anyway, I try the door, the door's open. I hear voices inside the theater. And I crack open the door, and I look inside, and there's people on the stage. I hear, psst, psst, come here. And I look, and there's a woman, an elderly woman and, an, and a husband, both well-dressed, sitting in the back row. They go, here. She goes, sit down. What are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I told her the story. I just did my first play. I was going for a beer. I want, you know. She said, well, you have to meet Mac. And so uh, at, at the first break in rehearsal, uh, she calls for Mac Dixon. She says, Mac, Mac, come here. I want you to meet someone. And he walks over to me and he says, Shay. And I went, yeah, Shay. He said, so can you do an Irish accent? And I said, well, I could fake one. And he said, good answer. He said, take this. And he hands me the script to the play that he's got in his hand. And he said, go backstage. You're about to make your entrance. I said, what? He said, we have opening night. We're one man short. I just lost the guy who's playing the second furniture removal man. And it turns out that I had stumbled into the final dress rehearsal for Juno and the Paycock by Sean O'Casey. It was a great play, and I met all these great people, and, you know, I was, they just opened their arms to me, and, I, you know, it was fantastic. So at the end of the first week, he hands me a $10 bill. I go, what's this for? He said, well, welcome to the theater. You're now a professional, and I expect you to act like one. <laughs> I came to the States... Uh, back in 1999, so it's 17 years ago, I came to, as a student with a, with a goal to study. I was chasing a, a girlfriend. During the recess in the summertime, I found out there's an island. And I found a big Lithuanian community of uh, 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 friends of my age, students, and uh, just a great group. The island has some kind of mixed feelings. Because once you lived on the island long enough, you start to hate it, but it, it comes naturally to you again. But in the long run, you know, you can't live without it. We have both now have uh, fallen in love with this island. And one day I'm reading a trade journal in bed. Which says a lot about my sex life. <laughs> and there's an ad, and it says Nantucket. And I nudged Garth and said, look, it says Nantucket. And he said, oh, gee, nobody gets a job looking in a newspaper. And I said, but I think I'll call. 
So I called, and the director of the NHA's name was Jean Weber. So then it's Jean and Jean. It turns out she's a Scotswoman, and I am too. So I was invited to come over to Nantucket. I, I was still working, and I decided I'll travel backwards and forwards, and then I decided to heck with this. I'll see her once or twice a year, or else I'll quit my job and come here. And so that's what I did. Because every time I go off island yeah. and I come back, I go, oh, that's so true. great to that's be true. back. You, I, so you, I she, think she's it's right. still there. Yeah. You, you get a little jaded when you live, live here. You, you, you think the whole world is a bit like this. And then when you go off and come back, you really appreciate what, how nice it is, you know. Yeah. So back in September 2001, I was living in South Florida. I really feel, felt like I needed a change in my life. I wanted something different. I kind of outgrown everything in Florida. And a friend of mine lived on Nantucket. She invited me to come to Nantucket. She said that the lifestyle here was really laid back and relaxing and very chilled. So instead of coming to visit, just a visit, I decided that I was really ready for a change. So I just packed up my apartment, put it all in a U-Haul and drove up and came to Nantucket on the slow boat. This was like a hidden gem. When I seen Nantucket, I was just like, wow, this looks incredible. The sense of the community on Nantucket is incredible and I'd never felt anything like that. And it gradually, it's one, I feel like I always say to people when they come to the island, like new people, this island either embraces you or not. Like if, you're, if you give to the island, and to the community, then the island will totally give to you in so many ways. My first trip to Nantucket was fabulous. I went fishing with my brother and Tom Malesko. We left Maddock at Harbor, went across to Tuckernuck, and Tom pulls his boat into the beach and hands me a fly rod. It says, cast over there, while I set up Eric's gear. I made one cast and hooked into a striper, a keeper. I was hooked. Everyone who comes to Nantucket has a story. What's yours? I was so struck by the grayness and the absolute peace and quiet. I mean, it was sort of like going to a place for a retreat. For me, Nantucket is a place of spiritual rebirth and romance. And I can't imagine living anywhere else. Probably stop itself. Good. So it is. Oops. Um. It, it is kind of a love story. I mean, everyone that in the film has fallen in love with Nantucket in a very individual way. You know how you come to the to the island shapes you in some way your relationship with the island. But it's it really is a place that captivates us. We're here, it's March, we're here. It's cold, it's March, and we're here. Um, and I'm, I'm really, as a wash ashore, I'm really happy to be here, and I, and I know that, that uh, the love for the island is reflected in some of the comments uh, in, the, in, the, in the film, which really made it worthwhile for me to actually make a film, make a film that was a positive statement about Nantucket, a positive statement about the people that have come here and made Nantucket their home. Um, we sometimes, I think um, both uh, the, Lith the young Lithuanian man and the, uh, uh, the Grimmers both made the point that you do get, you do get a little bit jaded here, you get a little bit, oh God, Nantucket, and then you leave, and you go back to the, out to the real world, or the other world, which is real, good question, and you come back, and you, and you, and you, uh, there's this sort of breath that you take when you, when you, when you come around Brant Point and say, oh God, here we are, he's home again. Um, 
it was great. I, you know what I found moving was the woman who said, uh, we asked ourselves, what is the real world? So I, yeah. I, I, really, Brad, I found yeah. that quite moving. And to me, this is the, uh, what I prefer to have, where I prefer to have my world centered. This is a great place. Yeah. Um, do we have a mic? Yeah. What I like to do, I know that, uh, like I said, everyone has a story of how they came to Nantucket. You know, Quiz what, time. <laughs> pardon? Quiz time. Quiz time, right. <laughs> no, everyone has a story. Uh, some people came for jobs. Some people have been coming since they were children because their parents came and their grandparents came. Uh, um, The football coach came, um, Capizo came, because he thought, the story, I actually haven't interviewed him, but I'd love to, uh, but he, his story, as I understand it, was that he thought he was going to uh, Nantasket. Uh, he, I mean, he got a job at Nant- what he thought was Nantasket. He's from Fall River, I believe. And uh, somehow he ended out here. Uh, people get on the wrong boats, or they come out for a day trip from uh, from Hyannis or from Woods Hole or New Bedford or whatever the appropriate em- embarkation point was at the time. How, Mark, how did you end up coming to Nantucket? Because you're right in front. <laughs> um, I, I came here for, right out of college, first interview, first application, and I took the job. And then I planned on leaving after two or three years, but... Um, I, I ran into someone, and she locked me in one of the rooms upstairs, and I couldn't get out. So. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Barbara? Oh, I came here totally accidentally. I um, came here to visit a friend who was working here um, at Captain Toby's, and I wandered up to the superintendent's office and said, I had a teaching job in Ohio, do you have any applications for the following year? And the, Mr. Olney said, well, actually, we have an opening now. Can you move immediately? And that was that. <laughs> she, uh, this is, what about you, Dot? You've been coming for a very long time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I, when, when my daughters left my home and went off and finally one, one got married... I wanted us all to get together somewhere. And I was living on Long Island, so I rented a house on Fire Island. Meanwhile, my daughter and her husband, he went to Harvard Business School so, and got a job when he got out. So they were living in uh, somewhere right near there, forget where, and they, they took a weekend and came up to the Cape and stayed at a rooming house or boarding house and the the fellow said, what you should do is get on the fast ferry and go over to Nantucket and rent bikes and ride your bikes around. So that's what they did. And when she got home, she called me and said, Mom, Mom, (laughs) you've got to rent on Nantucket. And that, that was my introduction. Living on Long Island, it didn't occur to me to go somewhere with beaches. I mean, we, Lantucket's an island, you know. <laughs> but since they were up here in Connecticut, Hartford or New Haven, they were in Hartford, I think, um, it was so convenient for them. And, and I continued to do it because as the two girls were married and then had children, uh, the, I want, oh, one of my other daughter married a Dane and was living in Copenhagen. And I wanted her children, both children, I wanted them all to know each other, be close. And of course, they, they, mostly they spent their summers here and they're bonded for life. <laughs> Great. <laughs> now it's, uh, you know, you get family, you get jobs. Uh, uh, I was going to hand it to Sue Ellen, but she's escaping. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, now the, the, like I said, there's, there, there are lots of different stories. Um, the the ones that 
that uh, you remember are the ones that are uh, they have a they have a kind of a catch to them. Or, uh, I got a job the first day I walked in. John Shea. Uh, I could have done 20 minutes on John Shea. Actually, there was a whole <laughs> series of uh, anecdotes, but. He got a job in the theater his first day on Nantucket. You only uh, had to ask him one question. That, as I remember the interview, tell, tell me about coming to Nantucket. And it, he went on for 20 minutes. Right. He's like, right. It, he's great. Once you get him to come out of that shell. He really yeah, <laughs> right. He's very, you know, introverted. <laughs> um, anyone who, what about you? <laughs> John is a fellow Romeo uh, in, in the uh, luncheon sense. Um, <laughs> my late wife Nancy and I were looking for a place to near the water. We lived in Hart, outside of Hartford. And uh, we, we uh, dissed the Connecticut shore. We dissed Martha's Vineyard. And finally went down the street to a friend, a neighbor's, who we realized owned a cottage in Nantucket. Uh, and so we arranged with them to rent this cottage for a week in late August for I think $125. And we came out here, this was 1968. Nancy was eight and a third months pregnant with our second child. We spent a week, it was foggy. I fished, I caught fish, we came back a month later and met up with Dick Denby. Some of you remember Dick as a uh, wonderful uh, wash ashore real estate agent. He took us all over the place and we finally uh, got out of the car at a lot on Starbuck Road in Madiket. Get out of the car and along came a black lab and flushed a pheasant. And I said, sold. <laughs> so we bought. We bought this half acre for 6,000 bucks, and this is 1968, probably paid too much for it then. Uh, and a few years later, built a house, expanded the house, expanded the house, bought the lot next door, moved here permanently in 1995, and uh, I just sold the house uh, a month, a couple of months ago, for a little bit more than $6,000 and I'm now a Sherburn Commons resident right next door to Ann Bratt, who was featured in the, in the movie. Uh, so that's how we got here. Uh, and it was a matter of, well, like it's corny, but falling in love with the island. We just did. Uh, we couldn't have thought of anywhere better to be. Hard to get to, thank goodness. Um, but here I am, still here. <laughs> Still go, and going to Romeo's with this guy. <laughs> you want to tell a little bit about how you came to the island? I came here on my honeymoon in 1954. Mm. Uh, my husband was from Boston, and uh, we, we had no money. I'm from New York. We met in New York, and um, we had no money, so where would we go? Well, we'd go to, he suggested, Nantucket. Now, the irony of it is that I had worked on the Cape and as a waitress. After I got out of college, I wanted a kind of a numbing job. And uh, so I worked as a waitress there, made friends there, never knew there were two islands <laughs> out in the bay somewhere until my husband suggested that we come here on our honeymoon. And we did, and it was May, and it was cold. We had come from New York in our little summer clothes, and we came to New York. I came to Nantucket, and it was freezing. It was so cold, and we just had these little ditzy clothes. Um, there, there wasn't a thrift shop open, so we would cower behind the dunes trying to keep warm. But it was wonderful, and we, I knew right away we had to stay here. And so we did. <laughs> Great. Well, the question was, how did I choose the people? Well, okay. I play bridge with, uh, at Salt Marsh with Ann Bratt and Elizabeth Murray. And they had to have stories, so I asked them, and they said, what well, you want to hear from me? And I said, yes. So there were two. Um, I play poker with Andres, and, well, 
with, yeah. with Larry, but Larry was, Larry was on the other side of the camera. Um, Garth and Jeannie Grimmer Grimmer. were friends. Uh, John Shea, I was, uh, I've been involved with theater. I've been here on the stage here and the uh, Moby Dick rehearsed. Um, And I was in John Shea's film that's actually premiering the 28th of April in Nationwide, uh, The Grey Lady. Um, and, uh, and then I was talking to Lisa Fry, and she had a great story. Uh, and John, and John Trudeau, I know, Trudell, I know, and he had a great, how can you turn down a story about a guy proposing on the way to Nantucket? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a great story. And Lisa, packing her, packing her U-Haul, coming up here, Sight unseen. Blind. Yeah, that's something. That's I a mean, commitment, isn't those it? Are, that's, those yeah. are commitments. Those are. You, if I, the problem I had with the film was that it could only be ten minutes. I mean, I could have done twenty of these, uh, and uh, had a much longer. Um, uh, You'd still be editing. Yeah, I, that's, that's probably true. That was the limit. It was the Nantucket Short Film Festival. And let me turn this off. Nantucket Short Film Festival has a limit, 10 minute limit. Now I'm talking to the NHA uh, and uh, Nantucket Community Television about doing more of these and making them longer and creating some programming for them and hopefully getting involved with the oral history project here. I spent this past Saturday in a seminar with uh, the Katie and the the, the oral hist- historian uh, group here, which is very it was very interesting. Um, but there are lots of stories out in Nantucket, not just about how you got here, but you know what kept you. Uh, what was it like in the uh, in the fifties, the sixties, the seventies? Uh, what or the forties? Go back to Elizabeth and and Anne. Uh, so there's there's a lots of material here to make to do films uh, and to do history. I did a lot of genealogy of my own for my own family, and the thing that I regretted most was not talking to my grandparents when I. Was smart enough when I was when they were around. You know, my father, my grandfather died when I was sixteen. And I was he was just getting interesting. But he was, you know, he's born eighteen seventy one. You know, all kinds of things I got to talk to him about that I never got a chance to talk to. And using uh, film and using um, you know oral history re- recording. Is a really important link between today and yesterday. And uh, anybody who's doing genealogy, talk to Great Aunt Mary if she's still around, because she'll remember stuff that, that isn't in, written down on your family tree anywhere. Um, question, um, feel free to raise your hand. We can open the floor for a and a if you'd like. Um, if any folks have other questions, come on back here. John, when did you first get here and why? <laughs> <laughs> My first trip was in 1995. And uh, my wife has a, had a business in Chappaqua with uh, a needlepoint business. And the Actually, they just purchased this business from a from a woman or a state of woman who had died, and uh, they the, the Silver Needle had done a trunk show on Nantucket historically, and uh, so Sue Ellen and her partner came to Nantucket, rented a one of those little houses on what is it South Wharf, and for a few days, and I came with them, and that was it. And I went fishing with Malesko, and oh, actually, that, that actually, uh, I went, we came back the next summer, rented a house on Summer Street, 
and then rented a house on Milk Street, and then we bought a house on North Liberty in 98. Uh, and I love it, you know, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> we got a question in the back. John, could you, and, and maybe your partner, could you talk a little bit about the editing process? I'm sort of curious about the stuff that didn't make the film and some of the things that went through your mind, either in terms of narrative, how it looked, you know, people scratching their ear. I mean, in terms of getting rid of the film to get down to the 10 minutes, what are the things you had to deal with? Well, I had, um, it's actually, uh, there were a couple of things. One is um, anything that I said was edited out, which wasn't really very much. We just kind of got them going. That's the whole secret to oral history, which I it was reinforced on Saturday. Was, what happened? <laughs> yeah, let them talk. Okay. Go ahead. Tell and um, you, you have to make a, each one of these segments, you had to make a story. Or, or it had to have a thread that went through it. So you can eliminate quite a bit just because it's not relevant to the story you're trying to tell. Uh, if I were trying to do a different film, I would have had it edited differently. I would have had different things remaining, different things taken out. Um, but it was, you picked a thread, and if it wasn't, you have to be really brutal when you get it down to one minute, because each one of those interviews was about a minute, if you're really brutal. And if it doesn't really add to that particular thread, out it goes. Uh, now, I've talked to Elizabeth and Anne about taking their interviews and making a 10-minute a uh, or 15-minute uh, show, and that would be quite different, because I can talk about different things, about you know the bakery and... Uh, uh, Phil's uh, war service and things like that that were in the film, but weren't relevant to the to the uh, thread that I was trying to follow. Uh, but editing is really hard, and it's tedious because you're trying to get, you know, you take out. Okay, I can get ten seconds out of here. I can get, I can move these frames out, or I can. Uh, you know, if I had to do it again, I would edit it a little bit differently, but it's because I've come up the learning curve. And it's pretty technical, too. It's a, it's a very complex piece of software, and, and uh, getting familiar with the tools took some time. And fortunately, I had uh, Mark uh, to help, one of the people at the station to help, and I had a, when I hit the wall. Okay. So you think next time you would uh, ask leading questions, you would ask, when you heard an interesting subject, you would know to ask particular questions to get them to say, speak in a soundbite? Well, you want, when, you, when you're interviewing someone, you want to give them as much leeway as you can without getting too far away. Uh, the, one of the things you want to kind of protect yourself against is imposing your particular story into their story. I mean, once, you, once they brought up something like uh, the real world, you know, what, what's oh. the real world? The way she explained that part was quite good, but if they talked about Murray's Toggery shop... You might, yeah, you would say, tell me a story about, about Murray's Toggery. Uh, and then she would tell whatever story was in her, right. what she was really thinking about. I mean, you can't guide it too much, or it, or it's, it doesn't... You lose the thread. Yeah, you lose yeah. the thread. You want to, you want to let them talk. Right, Katie? Katie, you have a question? Here. I'm interested in this real-world concept. Visitors come here, and they think we are not living in reality. It is our reality. It's not theirs, but it's ours. We live here all year round, full time, we live, we work, we live according to the rhythms of the island, so it's very much a reality for us. I always get the impression that, that they're thinking that we have moved here to escape reality. There are different kinds of reality. That's right. That's a good point. I, uh, yep, we got one more question coming over here that, from I, Tony. I, we, live, we live on North <laughs> yeah. Liberty Street, and our bedroom is right on the street, and a few years, a couple of years ago in the summertime, 
uh, the windows were open. You could hear this group of adults walk by, and one of the adults says to the other, he says, you know, I keep looking up for the monorail to take me back to my hotel from Nantucket land. <laughs> I have just a 10 seconds comment. Uh, continuing to what Karen McNabb said, visitors who come to Nantucket look at us and say we live in our own reality. As a wash ashore here, I would say we live in our own identity because there is an own Nantucket identity here. And this is the great thing about this place. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, we'll wrap things up now. I want to give a huge round of applause um, to John and Larry for today's Food for Thought. Um, thank you so much. If you have any um, questions or anything like that, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you after the, after the presentation. Um, next week, we will have um, Executive Director um, Bill Tramposh um, talking about his experience here at the NHA. He is leaving in May, um, so he will be here next week for our Food for Thought. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure.